Hello and welcome to Hacking the Exile. Uh, this time I'm gonna drop the tagline and directly introduce uh, the star of the show, Amelia Andersdotter. Welcome. Thank you for such a warm welcome. Well, it's, it's always a pleasure to have you here. You've been on the show before, a couple of times, and you will most likely be on the show again in the future. It is, after all, a show about your work and your team's work. So, uh, talking about work, it has been a busy week this week. We had an intense couple of days in the beginning of the week, and uh, now we're engaging in the fourth intense day of this week. But it's a slightly bit slower today than the previous days. Right. That is why we have time to do this, for example. Indeed. We wouldn't have time to do this on, say, Tuesday. It would have been very difficult, yes. But let's... let's... I would have been late. Oh, uh, yeah. Which is very unusual, to be sure. But let's get back to Monday. Uh, we organized an event uh, with the Commission on Monday. Right, so the European Commission, of course, being a very large institution, has a lot of different projects. And one of the projects that they're now looking at initiating is a combination of uh, information and communication technologies and art, and how this can be useful to society and what, how the European Commission can be helpful to artists in different member states in uh, various projects that, that bring to light um, ethical problems or artistic problems with information and communication technologies. And so we had some presentations of previous artwork done in this field, a really cool project from 2001, which was uh, demonstrated, I think, at Ars Electronica, um, that was called Global String. And so this was in the dawn of the networking age, and people were imagining what happens if everybody can, make, can play a bass guitar that covers the entire planet. Um, so that was a really cool project. We wait, all... a, wait a minute, a bass guitar the size of a planet? Right. The global string. Well, that would be impressive indeed. It's been done. They, In... they built a bass guitar the size of a planet. Right, so with long distance communication... Um, the but way they, were that... as, they were not a real bass guitar anywhere, because I didn't see it. No, you have the real string. So you can actually oh. play a string and the sound will be transferred between different parts of the world. Okay. And you can actually make music with other people in other places through this one instrument that through telecommunication transfers sound and impressions over long distances. Okay, so it's not one big long string covering the no. entire planet. Okay. No, but the strings that they were using were, though quite large in any case. So okay. It's a very cool project. Mm -hmm. We actually have this um, uh, good doctoral thesis from Sweden, which was written at Gothenburg University in 2006, which covers um, many, many different arts projects that were done in the 1990s and the early 21st century around um, connectivity and uh, global communities. It was written by Dr. Matthias Klang um, mm -hmm. yeah. in, uh, I think, History of Technology or so. And it covers also, for instance, the um, uh, Venice Biennale from 2002 about viruses. So computer viruses is an arts form as well as um, sometimes a spreader of malicious code that harms the user. Um, but there are some examples of when viruses have been used to spread, for instance, happy messages to the populace. Um, and other similar things. There used to be a website up called uh, VX Haven where you could read more about this, but it was taken down by Ukrainian authorities at request of the American authorities. And so a great piece of internet history was lost and somebody should do something about that. I will look into it straight away. Thank but you. moving on to Tuesday. Right. We had more events because, you know, one day of events is not enough for us. I think that certainly Jan Losek will have been slightly... Um, stressed out this week. We were organizing actually a, um, a three-hour panel session about the urgent need for copyright reform along with our colleague Paweł Solewski from um, the Polish conservative faction in the European Parliament um, and Ms. Marietje Schrake from um, the Dutch Centre Liberal Party. And so um, that was an immense success. I thought we had a really good lineup of, of, of speakers. It was very clear also um, that the need for copyright reform is, is large. There's been almost no movement from the Commission in this field, despite the fact that Parliament has actually called for revision and reform of the copyright framework for the European Union. And especially now that the Commission is choosing to target so much attention to the digital single market, one would assume that they'd be more keen on also addressing the largest issue for the digital single market, which is that we have a licensing nightmare that nobody can penetrate. Um, but we presented some ideas about future reforms. Um, and this would be a reform of the InfoSoc Directive? Um, yeah, right. So the InfoSoc Directive is... <coughs> 
kind of the main copyright directive of the European Union. It's the one that defines um, flexibilities in the copyright framework, what are the actual rights of rights holders, what are the rights of users of culture, and, um, and all the exceptions, and all, all the exceptions and the limitations that apply on the monopoly right. Currently, not harmonized. Not at all harmonized mm -hmm. in the European Union, and this is a big problem for libraries, teachers, private citizens, uh, startups, people that do remixing, DJs, um, basically all new online markets. There's a reason that we have incredible service fragmentation on the European market, um, because it's impossible to launch services other than on a state by state basis. It's by far the single largest um, impediment to the formation of an internal market um, for digital things right now. And this was addressed at the conference? It was addressed at the conference. Um, I was particularly happy that uh, in Poland they've done a very good research on what are the problems, how should they be fixed, uh, where do we go with the copyright reform. And so I think my colleague Mr. Selewski um, had a very good presentation of some of the outcomes of the consultations that the government's been doing. And, in Poland to um, en envisage how, how the Polish government can work for a sustainable copyright reform. And so that was very positive. But Poland can, can't do this alone. We need to do it on the European level. Well, Poland is actually a quite strong member state. You're talking about a member state here that's been growing consistently throughout the financial crisis. Yeah, so they can they have lead the way, but uh, they will, for the harmonization perspective... We need also to change the European laws. Yeah. This is true. If and, only and changing Polish national laws will not be sufficient. Um, but it, but it's certainly, it's certainly very exciting that we have this um, new member state, which isn't actually very new, but um, that anyway we have this this country, which is anyway um, strong and also willing to dedicate some time into freedom of speech issues, um, user flexibilities, kind of a friendly internet that is actually conducive to social and political discourse, because I think it's something that a lot of other governments aren't really doing. Yeah. Well, if, if anyone had asked me five years ago, I would not have put my money on Poland. Me neither. It's, a, it's been an incredible journey and I'm very, very happy that we got around to... Or I hope that this is the beginning but, but, of more collaboration in this. But case. will the Commission listen? The European Parliament is not actually a weak institution. Listen, it's embarrassing for the European Commission that the European Parliament is organizing complaining events where we're saying that they're not addressing the, the single largest issue that they should be addressing. Um, and indeed, the European Commission, after the failure of the Licenses for Europe program, which was basically the Commission um, evasive maneuver not to have to do this thing that they anyway know they have to do, yeah. um, that program collapsed. And so now the European Commission probably will be forced going into a consultation process uh, on what are the problems. And so one of the key issues here is how does the Commission phrase the questions in the consultation? Mm -hmm. um, and we're hoping that the European Commission will find the courage to phrase them somewhat constructively so that people can actually talk about and address the problems that they see. Uh, and there are a lot of different agents in Brussels that are um, busy explaining to the Commission what do you ask to get a useful response to this consultation? Um, but we will be working um, both in, in Poland, in the Netherlands and in, in Sweden and of, of course other member states also. We're hoping the German Pirate Party would help us with this um, to help citizens actually respond to the consultation as well. And, and what will be done here in the Parliament? Um, in the European Parliament I hope we'll be able to continue organizing these events where we address effectively um, what the European Commission is or is not doing. Uh, the European Parliament uh, base that we have now is certainly sufficient to get some kind of working group uh, of interested parties and members um, where they can share and coordinate their experiences of the European Commission and also ensure that the Parliament can stay strong in its position with respect to the European Commission and ensure that co the Commission acts. Um, and that is certainly within the power of the Parliament to do that. Um, I think we have a good base for such a collaboration leading into the next legislature and I'm very, very happy that these first steps towards continued cooperation could be taken already now. Um, it's never too late to start cooperating for a better future. No, of course not. But after this rather intense session, we ended the day on a more relaxed note with a film screening. Right, so we've also screened in this week a film by Mr. Javier Botero about the history of WikiLeaks and the um, um, Bradley Manning leaks and what's been happening with that case. 
And so the film was a parallel story of basically the rise and fall of Julian Assange and the, um, what appears to be mostly a consistent fall of, of Bradley Manning. And what does it mean to be a whistleblower? What are the dangers you face as a whistleblower? Um, what, what is this character behind WikiLeaks that drove um, that, that drove publications of secret government documents in, into the light in such an incredibly um, um, popular and um, flagrant way. And so the, it, I think we had a lot of visitors on, on the film screening. It was our, our best film screening when it comes to audience yet, by far. I, I, I counted them, we were over 100 people in the audience. Right, so we had one of these big rooms and it was almost full mm -hmm. in, the, in the hall. So this is clearly a topic that a lot of people are curious or very interested in. Uh, also, of course, in the context of, of Sweden and Julian Assange, there's been some severe difficulties. <laughs> but I assume also with the current Snowden leaks, uh, the whole WikiLeaks story becomes relevant uh, again. Well, so one of the really interesting things from the answering and questions sections is actually that we had one member of the audience address to Mr. Botero why it is that um, why it is that the American government could act so forcefully against WikiLeaks, and Mr. Botero answers that this is because they were effectively able to separate WikiLeaks from traditional publishers. Uh, but in this summer, we've heard both the NSA general director and um, really top-level officials from the GCHQ. Um, and even David Cameron going after traditional media as well. And so what one has to ask is why media is not taking better care of protecting itself. Um, clearly when it came to WikiLeaks, media uh, bought into the story that WikiLeaks is not media, therefore we don't have to protect WikiLeaks. Uh, but now that we have hard drives of The Guardian being destroyed, um, top level officials at security agencies calling on media to stop reporting about current events, uh, one would assume that the interest for media in, in defending The Guardian and The New York Times and The Washington Post, these are clearly not fringe or startup medias, right? These are newspapers with more than a hundred years of honorable history of news reporting, and media is still incapable of defending itself against governments that are making limitations on freedom of press, um, which is really, which is really very surprising. We didn't get there in the discussion on, on Tuesday, but it's just one of those thoughts that I had when. It will be an interesting topic to explore: the escalated conflict between media and secret services. Right. And, and so, because ironically also, media is the tool that we have to cast a light on some of these processes. Okay, but, but the film screening was a success. Uh, and after this, uh, that, those two days, the rest of the week has been, uh, well... Well, I'm not sure what you were doing yesterday, but um, <laughs> personally, I had also events that I was um, um, attending to. Talking about... Uh, liquid democracy at an event outside of the parliament? Well, it wasn't really about liquid democracy. It was more about the democratizing aspects of uh, social media. Okay. And so um, this was a, a lecture or a discussion uh, between an extended group of participants um, by, organized by the College of Europe. Um, and so I thought that that was really, a, really a very successful meeting that um, also brought a lot of new points to me. Um, the, when I looked through the participants list, actually they had a quite large um, amount of different stake, stakeholders or groups represented also that I would have originally thought wouldn't be there. Um, so that was a very successful event. We had an interesting breakfast meeting also, um, which was about kind of um, visions for technical architecture and how do we deal with technical architecture ethically and what, what does the technical architecture even mean? What is the purpose of the technical architecture? Um, what, what kind of values do we put in it? And so um, that type of high-level discussion is not super common in, in Brussels. Uh, we are uh, considerably more under the influence of large American industry groups. And so um, it was very nice to see that actually one of my colleagues from from Ireland had taken the time and um, uh, engagement to uh, bring some of the European work in this field to light. Because actually we have a lot of this work going on in the European Union as well. It's not like the European Union is a black hole of nothingness. The only problem is that we've been very bad politically at taking care of our own investments and our own kind of ethical frameworks. Um, 
and so it's very positive if, if also in the policy process we bring some of the European ideas and some of the European initiatives to light, I think. Personally, I, I, I snuck into a, an afternoon session on net neutrality and, uh, uh, and uh, the economic impact of net neutrality, uh, organized by our colleague uh, Mrs. Schrake. Uh, but uh, I was think it we, interesting. It was interesting. It was. Uh, they were talking about well, the the weak point of, of the text from the Commission, which would be specialized services. Right. And the assured the assured uh, quality of service um, thing that they're doing. Uh, well, well, the opening up for specialized services that can be uh, less than full internet. Uh, it's so stupid because I've been speaking also with telecoms lobbies about this proposal. And so the idea is that some of the large telcos want to open web server halls, but they don't want to open the web server halls under the uh, regulatory conditions that normally we apply to web server halls. They want to do it under the regulatory conditions that apply to telecommunications operators. That is why they need this special legislation. So basically they're saying, okay, I'm now going to become a web hotel, but I don't want to become just any web hotel. I want to become a web hotel that is privileged over all of the other web hotels and do this in my capacity as a telco, but because it's not really a telco, sir, or like, because the telco legislation doesn't really provide an adequate framework for this, I will ensure that the legislature gives me the opportunity to be a non-web hotel, web hotel, um, so that I can discriminate services on my network and not have to take responsibility for um, fulfilling the legislative requirements that normally would apply in this field. Well, well. The interesting thing at the event yesterday was the fact that the Commission clearly stated that their wording was ambiguous and that they were open to change it. Uh, well, sure. I mean, the, in, so in, Nelly Cruz said in 2009 that she would indeed protect net neutrality. And that is not what her proposal from this fall has done. Because it's the biggest open hole in the text right. that you can have. Right. Um, and so. I think Mrs. Cruz should be asking herself why her services find themselves incapable of ensuring that her promises are fulfilled. Yeah, and with those words, I think we have to close for today. Uh, and I'm pretty sure this is topics that we will get back to more than one time in the future. And of course, I would like you, I would like to personally thank you for coming and taking your time to talk with me and to thank you all viewers for watching and have a great day.